This is chapter 5, lesson 1 and 2 on probability um, rules, randomness, probability, and simulation. So the idea of probability. Oh, and the, the question to keep in mind is, um, what does the probability of a specific outcome mean in terms of the law of large numbers for the short term and the long term? So keep thinking about that as we go through this lesson. So a probability of an event is always an event um, is a number between 0 and 1 uh, proportion. Uh, or 0% or 100% representing how often we would expect it to occur in the long term over a large number of outcomes. So if it never happens, it would have a probability of 0, while always happening would have a probability of 1. The law of large numbers uh, tells us that if we observe a lot of repetitions of event, that's the proportion of times it occurs would be the probability we expect. Now, it's key to understand that that doesn't apply to the short term. Um, it definitely doesn't apply just to one uh, single outcome. One single outcome or five outcomes, we could have a proportion that is very different just by chance. However, as we get to larger numbers, um, just chance would dictate that over the long term, we would get a proportion that reflects the probability, which is why when we took samples uh, for our studies, we always wanted numbers over 30 or um, numbers over 50 would be even better because as you get um, into those higher and higher numbers, having an outcome uh, by chance where you, for example, flipped heads 50 times in a row, it's far less likely than uh, flipping it five times in a row. So larger numbers, more likely that you approach the actual probability of an event. Um, small number of trials that may not happen. So oftentimes uh, we get an instinct to think that probability or the um, that probability we know should dictate what happens in uh, the short term as well as the long term. Um, so for example if you flip heads once sometimes people think you're most likely to get tails flipping it again. However flipping the first flip has no direct effect on the second flip. They're each independent, so they don't affect each other. Uh, just like if you were to place, um, if you were to place a, a bet on black when you were betting at the roulette wheel, and it came up red, then thinking, oh, it's bound to come up black next. Each spin is independent, meaning it doesn't affect the next one. So that intuition doesn't work. Although it's hard to fight that intuition for many people because that seems logical to them. So even in a large number of chance occurrences, um, we may not have our number be exactly 50-50. So we may flip a coin 500 times. Um, we may not get 250 heads, but it's likely we have a number very close to that. Um, so the proportion is close to half heads and half tails. Let's take a look at what this looks like in a simulation. So here we have um, a, an applet that's going to show us give us a number of time to flip a coin, and it's going to graph it as we go, the proportion that we get here. So after every flip, the number of tosses on the x-axis are proportions on the y-axis, and we can see what proportion we're at and whether it reflects the uh, probability, which is one half, which would be right here. So we're going to toss five times. And as we toss five times, we can see the proportion bounce. Started up at 100% heads, dropped quickly after it our third heads, and then fourth heads and a fifth heads. You can see up here, we had heads, heads, tails, heads, heads. So we ended up with 80% heads, not 50% as we expected. The more we toss, though, the more this number tends to approach 50%. So that time we had three tails and only two heads. So if we toss again, we would expect it to eventually climb back down. See, in here it jumped up a little just by chance. We ended up having one tails and four heads. But the more we toss it, the more that number should approach 50%. So as we keep tossing, it may fluctuate, go up and down, but overall it should be at about 50%. And now you can see the jumps are starting to be much smaller. So if we added more tosses to this, and then we saw where it went, we could see that it stays, it starts to fluctuate. It's really far from 50% at the beginning, comes down, and eventually it just kind of teeters and goes up and down right around 50% as we move across and get into a large number of repetitions. Now you can see we're approaching 100 here. We're at, uh, I think we're gonna be at 95 after this number of tosses. And you can see how close it is to 50%. But again, it is not exactly 50%. Let's get five more tosses to take a look at what it looks like. And we end up with our proportion being 0.54 uh, for tails. 40.46 for heads. So not exactly what we expected, but closer and much closer than when we started.
When we perform a simulation, we're going to follow the same four-step process that we've been doing and we will continue to use throughout the year. State the question of interest about some chance process and define whatever your variable is. So in that case, we're looking at the proportion of heads or the proportion of tails. Uh, plan, describe how to use some sort of chance device, whatever it is you may be using, and how to identify the outcomes and the variable you're measuring, which has to do with A as well. Uh, do your calculate uh, repetitions of the simulation and conclude by using the results of that simulation to explain uh, the probability. Now keep in mind when we perform a simulation that there's only so much we can determine. So for example when we did the airline discrimination case um, we looked at it to see if it was plausible meaning that with the number of male and female pilots with 15 males and 10 females is it plausible to pull five females and three males when you're pulling a pool of eight, is it plausible that that was random? So what we say is, um, if we found a chance by chance that that is too improbable, and generally we use five percent as a fair measure of that. So if there's less than a five percent chance of it's occurring, it's not plausible. Now, still possible, but not plausible. Um, if there's more than a five percent chance, we can't say that it was for sure fair. It still could have been unfair. It could have been rigged. We don't have evidence that it was fair. We just don't have evidence that it was unfair. So when, when we're looking at simulations, we may have evidence that something is so improbable that it's not plausible. However, we won't be able to, to prove it. It's just like in the court of law, um, somebody's guilty or not guilty. They're not found guilty or innocent. You just either have enough evidence to convict them beyond a shadow of a doubt and they're guilty, or you don't have enough evidence and they're not guilty. You're not saying they're completely innocent. What it's really saying is that you just can't prove that they are guilty. So the biggest takeaway from lesson one here is the law of large numbers. That the more repetitions of a process we have, as we have as n, our number of repetitions approaches a larger and larger number, we should approach a, the actual probability and we should have more uh, fair results. That's why a bigger sample size when you're pulling it would give you more accurate information about your population and that that isn't necessarily the case in a small number of repetitions now let's look at some rules for probability so first let's look at what we're talking about when we talk about probability uh, sample space um, is all the set of possible outcomes so if we're rolling two dice we have um, six possible outcomes on each dice on each die um, so 6 times 6 is 36, so there's 36 different possible combinations of those two dice. So this picture up here represents the sample space of all possible outcomes when rolling two dice. So the sample space is all outcomes. Um, a, prob a probability model is a description of a chance process that consists of a sample, spot, a sample space and a probability for each. Now, so if we had a fair die, two fair dice, then... Um, we'd have a 1 in 36 chance of rolling any of these. Since there's 36 possible outcomes and each die has an equal chance of being on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Now, to define our sample space, um, we do it like this. So for a coin flip, we'd have a sample space of HT for heads and tails uh, for the flip of one coin. The probability of heads here equals the probability of tails. We have one um, po one possible tail out of two poss possibilities, one possible head after two out of two possibilities, um, since they're equally likely. For a roll of a, of a single die, our sample space would be represented by this, S, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, a fair die would give us each of those opportunities in the sample space a 1, 6 chance of occurring. So an event is some subset of that sample space. So it might be uh, the sum of three. So that would give us two possibilities, a 1 and a 2, and a 2 and a 1 that would be a subset of the whole sample space. Um, it's either one of the outcomes or a combination of the outcomes and we could we usually designate it with a letter like probability of A, B, C, or D. And we would define what that is. So we would say A equals the two dice sum to three and then we would give it a probability. Since there's two possible ways to do that out of 36 combinations, it'd be two out of 36 or one out of 18. So, probability of any event um, is always between 0 and 1, 0 never happening, 1 always happening. Um, all the possible outcomes must sum to 1, since you couldn't have more than 100%, um, that'd be one whole, or represent all the possible outcomes. Um, the, the probability of the sample space would equal 1, that just means the same thing, that the sum of all the outcomes is 1.
If each of the outcomes is equally likely, we can use this fraction, the number of outcomes that corresponds to the event we've defined. So in the case we just talked about, there was two ways to roll a 3, a 1 and a 2, or a 2 and a 1. The total number of outcomes in the sample space is on our denominator. There's 36 outcomes, so 2 over 36, or 1 over 18. Uh, in the same way, we could think about the probability of event does not occur. So the probability of not rolling a 3 would be 17 out of 18, since there's 34 out of 36 possible outcomes that do not add up to 3. So um, the, the complement is what we call that. So the probability of the complement of an event plus the probability of the event sum to 1. So the probability that you roll a 3 plus the probability that you don't roll a 3 add to 1, which makes sense because that would represent 100% of the time, either rolling a 3 or not rolling a 3. Um, so when you add them up, they sum to 1. Uh, if two events have no outcomes in common, then uh, so there's no possible outcomes in common. The probability that one or the other occurs is the sum of their individual probabilities. So since they can't happen at the same time, you just add them up. The probability of A plus the probability of B is the probability of A or B because they can never happen in common, which is what we see here. They, these two events don't intersect. The rectangle represents the whole sample space. These are event B, event A. If they don't intersect, meaning they don't, they can't happen at the same time, then we can represent them like this. These two events are mutually exclusive, meaning uh, event A doesn't happen when event B does. Um, over here we have another Venn diagram that represents the sample space being the, the rectangle there, and then event A being the white circle, while the complement of A is everything else in the sample space. So when you add it up, the complement plus A, you would have the total area of the Venn diagram, which would represent 1 or 100% of all the outcomes. Here you would have A plus B plus whatever out other outcomes in the sample space, adding up to 1 or 100%. If two events can occur simultaneously, uh, then they have an intersection, meaning event A and event B can occur. So if we were saying the probability of event A is rolling a 3, and event B is, uh, is rolling uh, a 2, on one of the two dice, those can occur at the same time. Um, although those would totally occur together. So if we have two events and they can occur together, meaning they're not mutually exclusive, then they can have an in, they have an intersection here. And now if we want to total these probabilities, we would have to add up the probability of A plus the probability of B, but then we would have to subtract this middle area, their intersection, because that's the probability that we already counted. You can think it'd be like counting that twice, since we already added A to B we would have to subtract that from the intersection. Subtract the intersection from the uh, from the sum. And we represent that event with uh, an intersection. Kind of looks like an upside down U here. A intersect B. So that's the probability that both events occur. If we try to represent the probability of A or B occurring, we use a U flipped the other way, which means A and the, the union of A and B, which means whether A or B happens. So they're both shaded there and then outcomes that aren't A or, and aren't B but are in the sample space are not shaded. And we represent that like this. So the probability of A or B. And to represent that we write probability of A plus probability of B minus the intersection again. Because keep in mind we don't want to count that twice if we're counting probability of A and B as we just discussed. So we would count all of A, we would count all of B, and then we'd have to subtract that area since in adding those two up, we have counted those, this area that they intersect in twice. So again, writing that in a more of a word form, probability of A or B, which is what we mean by the union, meaning that either occurs, uh, is the probability of A plus probability of B, and then you subtract the probability that they both occur at the same time. So you can see what that is in words down here to get a feel for what it is. So union is both things happening. Intersection um, is all of the, the chances that A and B occur, whether they occur together or not. The intersection, the upside down U, is when they both occurred at the same time. So A and B both have to happen. Um, the union is whether A or B happen. So think of the U, the union, as or and think of the upside down U as um, and. So take some time to read over the lesson and some of the examples and there's some more pictures in your book for chapter 5 lesson 1 and lesson 2. Here's your multiple choice. You're flipping two coins. Event A is flipping heads on the first coin while event B is flipping heads on the second coin. Define the sample space for flipping two coins and whether 
events A and B are mutually exclusive or independent. Remember, independence not affecting each other. Mutually exclusive means they both can't happen.